Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle D'Amico, and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Public Programs at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs, or CGA. Since its founding, our goal at the CGA has been to prepare global citizens to make a positive impact in the world. We do this through our two graduate programs, one MS in Global Affairs and a recently launched MS in Global Security, Conflict and Cybercrime. We also offer a wide variety of skills and knowledge-based continuing education courses and offer public events such as this that expand upon the topics covered in our classrooms. We are also very proud to be home to the George H. Heyman Jr. Program for Fundraising and Philanthropy. Through our open enrollment courses and certificates in fundraising and new certificate in digital fundraising, we offer professionally oriented educational options for those looking to grow within or transition to the fundraising field. Courses are taught by practitioner faculty who bring their vast experience, expertise, and networks to the classroom. We'll send out a follow-up message to all attendees, so please feel free to reach out with any questions you may have about any of our programs. Additionally, we've reserved some time at the end of today's conversation for questions from the audience, so please feel free to submit any you have for today's expert panel through the Q&A tool. And now I'd like to turn this over to Bianca Durney, founder and president of Aperio Philanthropy, our event partners on this series. The virtual floor is all yours, Bianca. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bianca Durini. It's great to uh, quote unquote see you all today. Uh, Purio Philanthropy is a fundraising consulting firm that specializes in helping nonprofits generate sustainable revenue growth for their mission. We provide services to organizations large and small nationwide, really focused on a combination of strategic advisory, hands-on support, and embedded partnership. We're thrilled to be here co-hosting the webinar today with NYU. I'm uh, delighted to introduce today's moderator, Linda Ortiz. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her and then she will introduce the panel to you. Linda is an accomplished leader who began her career in luxury retail and trans transitioned into fundraising. Working with numerous prestigious brands, she is credited with developing long-term strategic planning that aligned with the brand's overall mission and vision. Linda's successful career transition led her to pivot into the world of fundraising. Currently, she is working for the Office of Mission Advancement at the Paulist Fathers, supporting the executive leadership and development team members on a multi-million dollar national campaign. She is a member of Women in Color in Fundraising and Philanthropy, or WOKE, the Women in Development uh, WID Board of Directors and co-chair for uh, special uh, programs and projects. In addition, she holds numerous other volunteer positions in our community focused on helping, supporting, and guiding women. I am delighted to turn over the virtual floor to you, Linda. Apologies, Linda, you're still muted. Thanks. There we go. Thank you. So sorry about that. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Michelle. I'm thrilled to be part of today's session, and I'm happy that you are all here with us uh, today. Our topic uh, today is driving change in bold community-centric fundraising. Um, especially, we're talking about leading fundraising teams in today's environment. On one hand, fundraisers long for the return to normal meetings with donors, in-person events, interactions with colleagues, and networking in their communities. And on the other hand, fundraisers are saying, I don't want to go back to the way things were. And in crisis, we've learned about our purpose. We become more authentic and honest with each other and with donors. We've reckoned with the racist roots of our organizations and our industry in new ways. And we work to spark change to center our communities and carve new paths to thriving together. It's both exhilarating and challenging to lead fundraising teams today. And our panel will discuss what they're seeing and experiencing on the ground and how they're leading their teams through this period of transition, excitement, exhaustion, and promise. So let's get started. Um, I want to get started with introducing our panel. 
And starting with uh, Kat uh, Sevengross is the Chief Philanthropy Officer for Second Harvest of Silicon Valley. And since joining in 2017, uh, she has led efforts to increase revenues by 191%. It's phenomenal. And the dollars raised feed about a half a million individuals each month in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. And Kat worked on behalf of those experiencing homelessness for 10 years prior to the food bank. And she served in the Peace Corps in Armenia. She also spends her free time fiddling with her telescope. And second, Shavi Rosales is the Vice President of Human Resources at the Org Group, where she manages the day-to-day -day functions as well as strategic initiatives and long-term projects for the firm. Um, in her role, uh, Shappy partners closely with nonprofit organizations nationwide to recruit, onboard, manage, engage, retain, and grow talent. And she's an, uh, an incredible expert in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then Tysley Williams. Tysley is the Chief Development uh, Officer of the Bipartisan Policy Center. In her more than 20 year career, Tysley has inspired individuals and in institutions to invest more than $100 million in charitable causes. And as a member of the senior leadership team of the Bipartisan Policy Center, she oversees the organization's development or operations and is responsible for foundations, corporate and individual giving. Welcome everyone. It's so great to see you all today. Um, so let's get started. Um, I like to ground our conversation um, in hearing about each of your experiences as a leader of a nonprofit during the past year. And let's start with Kat. Hi, Kat. Uh, let's, so you're relatively new to your role. And as you've been learning about your organization with fresh eyes, what are you learning about its purpose in this moment? Well, I think first, thanks, Linda, for having me. It's so good to be on a panel with these other amazing women. It's very exciting to be here. Um, I love how you described uh, the past year and a half as both exciting and exhausting. I think that is a really succinct way of summing it up. Um, but I'll tell you, so I, you know, I get to work at this amazing organization that um, works on behalf of those experiencing food insecurity. We're getting groceries out to folks who are working multiple jobs, who are already on the brink. And before the pandemic, Second Harvest was distributing groceries to about 250,000 people a month. And then just within a matter of weeks into shelter in place, it doubled. And then in fact, during the pandemic, it like shot up above double and now has quote, settled back down to around 450,000 people every month. That's still 80% more than pre-pandemic. And I think what we're learning about our organization is that you know all of that hard work that went into that just incredible blitz of doubling all of our efforts. It was double the amount of food. It cost us twice as much, but it was also in the midst of, oh, we have to stand separately and we can't gather together to sort through the plums like we used to. Um, that all changed so quickly. And then we realized, oh, this isn't gonna change how we have added staff, how we have had to unite staff, that is where I have found a different purpose aside from our greater mission. So our greater mission is that anyone who needs a healthy meal can get one with Second Harvest. But my personal purpose in this work has shifted to better connect the people that are in this work because when we're remote, it's hard. I know Shabby probably has lots of stories about that in HR, but there is um, there was no easy fix for that. It just took an investment of time. And my role in, my, in, in this leadership role that I'm just so grateful to be in is to work on that purpose and, and to work on that connection um, and, and to not go into any meeting taking that for granted. Uh, because every time you show up in one of these little Zoom cubes, um, you, you have to come at it recognizing that, oh, you know, there might be something going on outside the frame here um, that's affecting us differently than it did pre-pandemic. And that's never going to change. My perspective now on how I approach this is, is always going to be changed because of that. Thank you, 
Thank you, Kat. And I love when you mentioned, you know, better connect with people remotely, because of course that is our new normal. Um, but um, thank you for that. And Tysley, I you are relatively new to your role. And as you've been learning about your organization with fresh eyes, what are you learning about its purpose in this moment? So Linda, um, relatively new. Um, yesterday literally was the 90 day mark. Uh, probably several people uh, listening have contemplated or actually made some professional shifts in the midst of the pandemic. And, you know, what continues to be at the center of my personal learning as a leader is the need to identify areas of commonality in order to connect and inspire people to push forward a collective and greater good. And so stepping into this new role where I am literally working with my team and our ambassadors in a very divisive time within our culture, trying to create space for Republicans and Democrats to connect, to ensure that policy at the federal level enables the direct service that Kat was so wonderfully centering. But prior to the provision of the service, there's often the infrastructure by which human service delivery can even take place. And so I've learned that in the midst of all that is unfolding, people are experiencing real issues outside of the office. And where we used to think of our charitable mission about serving quote unquote beneficiaries, I am really cognizant that we all in some shape, fashion and form are in need of support, are in need of service. And so I am challenging myself to incorporate myself, my staff, every being as someone who is in need of support. And kind of extending that to say, we all have an obligation and a responsibility to not only support one another, but to empower those who need support to speak to the support that is best positioned for them. Thank you, Tysley. I couldn't agree more to empower is key. Thank you. Um, Shabby, uh, you work with a broad array of organizations. What have you learned from fundraisers about uh, their experiences? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head uh, in your intro to the discussion. And I think what we've already heard from, from some of the other panelists, it really comes down to purpose. And I'd say purpose is shining through in, in two very distinct ways. Um, the first is finding purpose in the day to day. Um, so the past 18 months, I mean, I think has been devastating in a lot of ways, but in the context of this conversation, really interesting and an illuminating shift in the way that fundraisers are approaching their work. So by being forced to like abandon some of the mainstays, right, the pomp and circumstance of, of ball and gala season, the the intimacy of private cultivation events, the whining and dining of, of high net worth individuals, right? All of those avenues went away overnight. And our fundraisers were confronted with needing to forge a different path to connect with donors. I mean, that sort of like went hand in hand with the rise of, of CCF. And so that path is purpose. And they're having real conversations about meaningful change and regardless of what comes back, right, if any of those, if events and other things, regardless of what comes back, that is not going to go away. And the second thing I think is fitting purpose into like long-term planning. So it's not just about finding it in the day-to-day -day interactions. It's about really fitting it into, into their career paths. And so 
we found that people that are sort of most drawn to fundraising as a profession um, are naturally relationship oriented and purpose driven, and they derive joy out of being able to connect uh, passionate donors and causes that they care about, right? That's the role. But what we've seen emerge um, over the past year or, or year and a half or so on the front line is that fundraisers are saying it's not enough for me to serve in this function and make connections for other people. I need to feel passionate about the mission too. I need to feel the connection first before I can forge that for others. Um, and so this like great resignation tidal wave that we've sort of seen crashing through the sector um, is directly related to that need to find purpose and be fulfilled on a very on a very personal level. So I would say in those two very distinct ways, purpose sort of shines its way through. Oh, incredible. I agree. Purpose is, is key. Um, thank you for that, Shafi. Uh, Tysley, as you've been working with fundraisers uh, over the past 19 months, what are you hearing about their needs and what are they looking for leaders to provide? So, you know, I think centering back to the importance of having situational awareness, I think I'm hearing a few things. I think I'm hearing people express varying lived experiences. People are bringing their identities and saying, I am single and solo. And as a result of working virtual, I have been cocooned in silence. You hear people saying, I am an overextended mother who also has to be the lunch lady, the principal, and the after school tutor, right? People are really centering the different commitments and demands. And in some instances, they are not only turning to work as a way to help solve for, but they're turning to work saying, I need work to look and feel different. I need to be able to, going back to that sense of empowerment, express the best way that I can meet the expectations and the deliverables. And maybe that path forward is not the conventional set of meetings that starts at 9 a.m. and runs to five, you know, I need more flexibility. And I'm also seeing that people are also asking for, and I'm trying to think of the best way, Linda, to describe this. I think people are also asking for more autonomy around how they cultivate relationships, how they discern whether or not the strategies and tactics that we once held on should be a part of our permanent planning. Because I think people have had to work creatively and they've been successful bringing in dollars in ways that eliminate the gala that Shabby spoke to. And so I think I'm hearing people speak to the reasoning and the rationale behind why we need to rethink our business model and how and why we need to be open to testing other tactics and recognizing that some of it will come with us failing forward, right? We don't necessarily have all of the solutions and it isn't era proof. And I think people are asking leaders um, to not be so risk averse, to not look at this from this mindset of scarcity, but to see that there's ample opportunity and rightful reason at this moment to test, to be courageous and to be unconventional. That's absolutely incredible. And really to, um, to be able to do that is so essential. Uh, thank you for that, Tysley. Kat, I wanted to ask you 
Um, you've managed a large team that plays an essential role in your community. And I'm sure leading them is a major responsibility involving you know, constant learning. Um, tell us about a lesson you've learned in the past year about leading a fundraising team. <laughs> Just one? <laughs> um, well, I first want to say, Tysley, you so well articulated so much of um, what I think has been happening. And this notion of, um, like, at the very beginning of the pandemic, we were it was chaos. I mean, I don't mean to say we didn't know what we were doing. We know what we're doing at Second Harvest. What happened was within six weeks, we almost doubled our output. Ask any business to do that. Really think about like any other business. I don't want to name names because, you know, they're not paying for sponsorship, but, um, but like ask any business to just like, here you go in three weeks, literally double what you're doing with limited volunteer, limited, uh, you know, uh, you know, employee support because we, about 40% of our, um, you know, basically human resources are volunteers. And at the beginning of the pandemic, that'll just dried up, right? People were sheltering in place. They were being told by their corporate uh, leaders, don't go and gather. And these were longtime volunteers for Second Harvest and we lost them. Now, everybody in that first several months, I mean, that first three months I've, and I have worked I'm a hard worker, but I had never worked like I'd worked for those first three months. And we had to completely transform our operations and we all had to just go all in. And remember when everybody was like, we're in it together. It really was, I mean, I was doing stuff here that I'd never done before just so I could help somebody take a break. And I was, we were working all hours. We were working every day. And then there came a point where that whole all in it together thing just wasn't gonna hold all of that together. <laughs> it was just too much. And how you act in a crisis is different than how you sustain a long-term approach. And here in California, I think of it like a wildfire. When there is a wildfire, you don't conserve the water and you don't necessarily have a clear plan of how the fire is going to get out. You just have to go at it as fast as possible. When you're doing a controlled burn, you know what you're doing. It's more clear. It may seem chaotic, but it's not. And that's kind of the difference of where we are right now. And I would say that all of that sounds like, oh, well, what processes, what systems did you change? Yeah, okay, we had to change, by and large, almost, I mean, really, all of our food distributions, and we have about 900 locations across our two counties where we distribute food to families and seniors and students. They were most of them like farmer's market where you could walk up and choose what you want. With COVID, that all stopped, and we started doing drive throughs That was just totally different. Now, that's a, like a thing we had to do differently. But over, after that first three months of chaos, we realized we had to approach each other differently. And I, I think probably my team is maybe sick of hearing me talk about this, but y'all are new to it. So I have a visual aid. So I live by this now. I, we, and it. And I is how you show up. And I think everybody's feeling differently about how they show up, right? It's like, Tysley, you were talking about like, what do I need? You know, Chevy, you were, you were talking about like having that purpose. That's changing. We is how you interact with the people around you. And that delivers on the it. And what's really interesting to me is the last 18 months, it was not as much about the it. It was mostly about this right here, the we. How are we interacting? How can we anticipate what each other needs and actually believe each other? How can we build that trust? And my immediate team, I have uh, six directors that report to me and I love them. They're amazing. Some of the most talented people. And we have learned that nothing is faster than the speed of trust. If we can really get where each other is coming from, then we're delivering on that it without, not without trying, we're trying. But it happens so much easier than saying, what's the process for doing this project and engaging these donors? It happens because we're aligned and we got each other and we understand where each other is coming from. And it doesn't mean we know each other's deepest, darkest secrets, but it probably means we're going to have a meeting at 830 at night because that's going to ha be happen after you put your kids to bed. So there's a, it's a different approach that really looks at that we more intentionally than I ever have. And I would say my team has been so patient with me as I've learned that because I've often been like, get it done, let's move on, get it done, let's move on. 
And they have taught me, no, you got to stop and talk about us. And so now we intentionally every week talk about our commitments to each other and how are we doing on them? And it's changed the game. It's, you're absolutely right. It's a centering around the we. I love that. It is so key. <clears throat> it's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much, Kat. I uh, wanted to uh, talk a little bit about centering uh, communities. And um, Shabby, you, the fundraising community is increasingly aware of our profession's roots in perpetuation of systemic racism. And fundraising leaders and teams are always asking, how do we do better? And uh, what trends do you see across the sector in the movement to become more community centric? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the advantages of being able to work with so many um, different organizations and groups is being able to see those trends and patterns uh, forming across the sector from a, bird, from a bird's eye view. Um, and some of the changes I feel like are in, are in response to what they're seeing, right? It's like in a response to a stimuli on the front lines um, and being what people are being asked um, of by donors and constituents and stakeholders and board members um, to drive towards a greater you know, social social justice and, and equity. And others are, are proactive measures um, to what they're anticipating coming down the pike um, in their commitment organizationally uh, to, to anti-racist work. And so I would say the first big trend um, or pattern that we've seen sort of emerge over the last several months and, and years, or two years, I would say, um, is fundraisers having more honest and direct conversations and sometimes tough conversations with donors. Um, and the results have actually been surprising. I think there's almost like in, almost like in customer service, there's this like um, the donor is always right sort of mentality, right? Like do whatever they say, don't upset them. We want happy donors to, to give us lots of money, right? Um, but community-centric fundraising is, is turning that completely on its head. And this is a mindset shift that fundraisers, that for the fundraisers that have adapted to that quickly, they're having some difficult conversations and have actually found that they're forming deeper relationships and trust. And it goes back to Kat, what you were saying, I even wrote it down, nothing's faster than the speed of trust. I love that. Like that level of trust is, is actually improving their fundraising efforts. Like it is the pathway to actually getting better results, which, which is um, sort of counterintuitive than what, you would, than what you would think or what has been the ethos um, to date. The next is, um, on more diversification. And I think not just on staff and board, but it's permeated into a push for diversifying volunteers and donors um, and committing more time to, to cultivating meaningful relationships um, at all levels, regardless of financial commitment or no, no financial commitment at all, but being more based on impact to the organization and the community writ large. And then lastly, to that, to that community point, we're seeing more collaboration among similarly situated organizations. We were talking earlier about the theater. Um, so we're seeing like group job fairs for similar industries, um, collective training measures uh, for race equity and social justice, and the sharing and, and pooling of resources. Um, leaders and fundraisers across many organizations are seeing value in looking beyond their four walls for support um, and for greater impact within the communities that they're serving. And so um, this like higher degree of collaboration, I think, is a is a really big push and a and a positive trend that we've seen over over the last couple of months and, and year. Yes, a, definitely a positive trend. A lot more work to do, uh, but it's great that is moving forward. Uh, Tysley and um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you first, and then Kat. Um, practically speaking, what does a leading what does leading a team to become more community centric look like for you? So Linda, that is um, an exceptional question with an answer that probably changes every day. Um, I bring my lived experience as a descendant of slaves 
to the calling that I have as the chief development officer. And I'm also able through my lived experience to introduce the need to analyze practices to discern where we may be perpetuating inequity. And so when you step into any organization, whether it's my organization or another organization, at the door, the culture greets you. And the culture is literally when people's collective beliefs influence their behavior. And so when you step into an organization, you get to know the mission, the vision, the values, and you get to understand what it means to be successful in the context of that organization, which could be very different being successful in another organization. And so what I feel as if I'm able to leverage as a Black woman is the need to assess the culture and to discern what elements of the culture have only or largely been influenced by white dominant thinking. And within a lot of our organizations, the entire construct by which we do relationship building, our measures of success, the theory of change, even this concept of structure and process. It is a very white dominant way of working and not the only way of working. And so when I introduced this concept at the beginning about the need to be flexible and the need to recognize that things are not a one size fits all. There is also the opportunity from a cultural perspective to recognize that even though we have a charge as fundraising professionals to bring in dollars, because let's face it, without the money, we can't advance the mission. We have to create space to challenge the best practices, to say, actually, your algorithm is incorrect. Because see, I operate in this place and I had a teacher, uh, Dr. Angelou, when I was in college at Wake Forest, Dr. Angelou would say, there's a world of difference between facts and truth. You can introduce a fact, black people generally earn less than whites, but without centering the truth, why that is, you might actually be solving for a fact without recognizing that there are overarching truths that need to be centered, that need to be spoken, that need to be addressed. And so as a leader, I really center the the actual construct of power. And I really challenge myself to not settle into the white dominant thinking around positional power. You know, Nelson Mandela has a quote that says, a leader knows how to lead from the front, knows how to lead side by side, and knows how to lead from the back. You, you have to activate your power to sometimes say, I am going to be a faithful follower. And as the person with the power, I'm going to deliberately and intentionally position myself behind the person that I am inviting to share, share power with. And so I think community-centric fundraising has created a space for us to fertilize our thinking and for other people who think similarly about the need to shift power to create cultures by which more of these inclusive practices can take place. I couldn't agree more. 
it was perfectly said. Kat, uh, what are your thoughts about um, leading a team to become more community centric? What is that? Uh, look of like course, for you? I want to do another panel right after this with Tyson yes. on that. <laughs> yes. I think, well, I, I just want to just say, like, earlier you were talking, Tysley, about being risk averse and how how we, I wrote it down, actually, you were talking about failing forward and actually being in the space where taking those risks is okay, because you have to do it differently. And to bring it back to my favorite thing, the we <laughs> of our work, what the thing about focusing on, on your like leadership group and building that, um, those relationships in an authentic way, and really acknowledging where you need to grow and what you do or do not know, which is lots, um, hopefully on both sides, but um, is that it does allow for more risk taking. And so, you know, here at Second Harvest, we've been really reflecting on how can we be better stewards of our whole community. Um, and what I'm finding is as we develop those relationships, we develop that trust and it allows for grace when we screw up because we're gonna. Um, and we have to develop this not just amongst our staff, but also with our donors. And that's where I see this team being different uh, and, and showing up differently for our community. Because it's it isn't just fundraising, right? We're this bridge between the people who have the capacity and want to help the people that find themselves in need of support right now. You can, by the way, go back and forth across that bridge. You don't always stay in one group or the other. Um, and it's, it's leading us to have a bit more real uh, and dangerous conversations where we say, oh, it's always been this way. Should we always do it this way? And, um, and, and, and that shows up in very like kind of tactical, tangible ways. Like, you know, we really would love to have younger kids come in and volunteer at Second Harvest. It's great for families. And also we're still in crisis serving 80% more people per month than we were before the pandemic. And that really has a limit on what, like we have production needs. We got to get 10,000 boxes of food packed every day. We have to get 12 million pounds of food out the door every month. So while we would really love to have that community engagement with little kids and their parents, we just can't right now. And we just, we're honest with our community about it. And it's a disappointment, but maybe when we figure it out, when we get a different like facility structure, maybe when this is different, but right now it is what it is. And being able to have that real conversation instead of breaking our staff's backs to try to like accommodate a thing that really isn't gonna align with what are the needs of our clients are right now, that was hard. And I am so proud of our fundraisers for having those conversations and finding out that they're growing closer to the donor when we do. But it, this, um, this question of leadership comes up like, I struggle personally with what does it mean to share, you know, my power, so to speak. Like, I don't, again, we can have a whole nother panel because I would love to talk to you more about that. I think that so much of our work is sharing the true stories of our clients and really trying hard to remove how we've always done it because that would move our donors and making assumptions about who our donors are and then therefore fitting our client stories into some box that would then move these made up donors. <laughs> and we know a lot about our donors, but there's still this like, just kind of, you know, assumptions we've been carrying for a long time. And so when I first started working with clients years ago, um, I was working with kids coming out of the foster care system and, and kids experiencing homelessness. And I remember talking to them about their stories and how powerful it was if they were ready to share that with others. And so I've always believed that you gotta have, if a client wants to share their story, they gotta tell their story from a scar, not a wound. There's trauma in this work and it is real and it is part of our identities. And it's not okay for us to, to hurt a client to raise money to help other clients. So that was always a key component for me but what I think is amazing is I feel like our storytelling here at Second Harvest has really, I feel like they feel empowered and they have been showing up as if they do, where they are sharing a different kind of client story. They're, in, they're, they're promoting client surveys with our program staff so we can hear directly from our clients and how they're being affected and using that information instead of assumptions or one anecdote over and over. We're 
using the real voice of our clients in our audio ads. And that means they may be speaking Vietnamese, but we need to give airtime so that people can hear that language. And then we can translate it and say what they're saying for folks that don't know how to speak Vietnamese. It makes them real. And, and we need to be able to really convey the real hardship our clients are experiencing because that's why we're doing this work. And our clients right now are different than they were 30 years ago, 10 years ago. Our clients are working multiple jobs. Our clients are trying to hold it together in Silicon Valley. And everybody thinks Silicon Valley is full of like riches and it is. And then there's this huge gap and we have, it is, it is our duty to tell that story well. So I just, I really, again, I just, Tysley, I so love how you're approaching this kind of community centric, like iterative, uh, in an iterative way, because what we're doing right now, and I, and I'm, you know, very proud of it in five years, I'm going to look back and say, that was a step, you know, and, and I, I'm excited about those steps every time we take one. And Kat, I think, you know, I'm just going to build and, and Linda turn it yeah back over to you, but you know, it's interesting. I think it's because, and I think we can probably identify with our shared um, identities, but I think one of the reasons why I have so much awareness is because of the once wounds that I had yeah. that came within the social sector mm-hmm. with well-intentioned people, mm-hmm. but as an underrepresented identity, both as a woman and being black, I am just so much more cognizant of the unintended consequences to cultures that are not inclusive because I have been hurt and hindered, right? Emotionally, psychologically, even though that wasn't always the intention. And so it's just so interesting that especially within this human services construct, we can be so intentional in how we quote unquote treat those we serve, Mm -hmm. but don't recognize that we're interacting with humans who are peers, Mm -hmm. who are colleagues. And for some reason, that Mm -hmm. same level of respect, that same level of care and concern, it seems to be diminished and decreased when we're looking internally. Oh, I don't even, I don't, I I just think that is so great. I I think you're right. That's why I believe like having commitments to each other. This is the, we, right. We have to have the, we strong because if I'm, if I'm holding our storytelling staff, right. Accountable for how our clients are treated. Right. And I don't have to, because they are so very passionate about it, but I'm just using it as an example that isn't real. Um, We should be holding each other to each other. (laughs) Like, oh, I think that's so good. Thanks, Tysley. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. You, You're helping me by, you know, talking about the we, you know, and this is one of the reasons why I think we were all saying we say yes to these speaking opportunities because we all are lifelong learners and it creates an opportunity to to learn from each other. So um, I thank you for also helping me. And we're just sharpening each other's thinking. So I think Linda, we're hopefully meeting the goal of our educational <laughs> exchange today. You, you both certainly are. Um, it's such powerful, incredible words. Um, and so grateful to have you uh, all here to really share because it is so important important for everyone uh, to listen to this. And um, I want it, and thank you so much for that. It was uh, very powerful. Um, and I, I, with the audience members, I, it's time, uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free to post in the Q&A. Um, I wanted to see if um, we can answer some of them. Um, Oh, fabulous. I have a question here. Um, ah, okay. 
Oh, good question. A great discussion on the role of leaders and changing uh, role of leaders. Could you share more on what you see are some of the biggest leaps we need to make as teams and as individual contributors? Where is we thriving and where is we growing? Great question. Does anyone want to take on? Since it's my favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was going to say, Shabby probably has like, because you said, no, you know, no, I was going to say, Pat, you should go. But, yeah. But I'll, I'll start and then you can yeah. you know, add. I think, you know, my, my, uh, I think really it's, it sometimes feels funny to say, oh, we have commitments to one another. We write them down and we, we stick to them. But I actually think this is one of the strongest things a team can do is really name how are we going to show up for one another? And that's an area where I think most teams can grow, especially now after we've been doing this for so long, there's a high level of burnout. There's a higher, there's, there's a lower, um, I think there's a, there's just a lower ability to be annoyed <laughs> and, and really recognizing why people behave a certain way is helpful. Um, but, you know, I think that recognizing that you have uh, a response, like Tysley, you were saying this responsibility to each other and at Second Harvest, both with our executive team and also with my uh, team of uh, direct reports, we've created these uh, norms, these new norms we want to follow, these uh, commitments. And um, I think that that has been a regular reminder of how we want to show up in a meeting. Um, it reminds us of our role in the space because it's hard when everything kind of gets muddied. Like I'm here at the warehouse today, but it, it's still, it's like, you know, I could be at home in pajama pant bottoms. And, and when it's, when we're in and out that much, especially after this last year and a half, it's helpful to have something to root you and how you have committed to this other human being in front of you to show up. And just as an example, our, um, our commitments to each other for, for my team specifically is that we prioritize our relationships and are intentional of our support to each other. We disagree and commit. Uh, so we embrace healthy conflict and we commit to emerging unified. And that's really important for our, our broader team. I have about 70 people on my team broadly. And that's a really important thing for them to see that even if one of the directors doesn't agree, they're going to be unified because we, we came to an agreement. Um, we, we are open and receptive to the workout of timely and constructive feedback. We call it a workout because in the moment, it don't feel so good, <laughs> but later it's good and we're stronger for it. And then our last commitment to each other is that we, um, we, we, we are committed to reinvention. We bravely take risks uh, to reinvent the way we work and look for areas to say no. And we will have dinner and drinks and talk about these commitments they have come alive for us. And I, I think that that's an opportunity for growing. Um, I'll throw it to you, Shabby, if you wanna add more. I wish that I went first, cause I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, that was amazing. Um, no, I mean, the only other thing I would add is like, in terms of for like individuals and collectively as teams, I would say there's like two sides to the same coin of that we need to increase on both. Um, is greater vulnerability and willingness to, to go there, right? Whatever that means, like just more a greater willingness to like be vulnerable and be open and honest and all of the things that we've already talked about and or you've, you've already heard on this call today. Um, and then the flip side of that is also meeting each other with greater empathy, right? And like, if you are espousing, if I'm espousing that we need to be more open and more, more vulnerable, we need to meet that with open arms and to say, I hear you and I accept what it is, how you are coming to this call today, right? Like, I, I think there's something to that, um, that individually we have ownership. You cannot uh, ownership and control over. You cannot own and control what other people say and do if we could. I mean, a lot of this would be a lot easier, right? Um, but you can control what you do. And I, and I think that is, that is, leap conscientiously it's it's a mind it's a mind shift and, and I, it takes real intentionality and and it's not if it was second nature and if it was easy it wouldn't even be worth mentioning and so I think it's one of those things that we have to continuously um, bring to the forefront for ourselves and and for our teams and to, to Kat's point you know really make it um, a commitment that that comes alive 
And Shabby, I think what's amazing is we used to be able to do that more easily in person. Oh, yeah. Like, how yeah. you doing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and well, you now up on physical cues and other things, there was like yeah. other stuff. It was 3D, right? Or 4D or whatever. But like this environment is a lot tougher to, to meet that. Totally. Yeah. Because you just, you start, you open up Zoom and then you just go. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Totally. Oh, you're on mute. Tysley, would you like to um, comment on the question at all? If you're, you know, I'm I'm co-signing to what Shabby and Kat um, have introduced, and I'm and I'm sitting here saying yes, yes, yes. And you know, the only piece that I'll add around the we is just you know pivoting back to the space of vulnerability. Um, I think that cultures are very influenced by what we do when we hold the power. And I've been trying to work quietly in the closet so no one sees me, um, but I've really been trying to like step away from the demands. And balance isn't the right verb that I'm gonna introduce, but I've been trying hard to think through how do I align our capacity with our expected outcomes, outputs, and the impact? Because I feel like I'm very comfortable negotiating with investors. It's harder negotiating with my CEO and my other peers at the leadership table, taking up for the team to say, actually, we're not going to do this because we don't have the human resources. Actually, we don't have volunteers to draw. So when you think through the business lines and the way in which we do the work, I've got to be comfortable with saying, no one in this organization is gonna be a martyr. I'm not gonna be a martyr. The people on the team, we are not gonna be martyrs, right? We are going to be realistic about what can be done and there's not going to be an expectation or any judgment passed if you are simply centering sensibilities. For so long, we try to do a lot with a little and it still comes at a cost and at an expense. And so I'm just trying to make sure that we are not advancing a mission by any means necessary. Because there are people who deserve to be treated properly, to have resources, to have supports. And so I'm really trying to model as a leader how to navigate through that. And I'm really trying to like do that on front street so that my team can visibly see, learn, and also coach me through how to negotiate what's best for the team. Because sometimes that's in conflict with the advancement of the mission. Tysley, again, we realized managing projects has to look different now. We've doubled, like we've added so many staff and we can't actually we can't make decisions the same way because it used to be like, oh, the person in this role and this role and this role used to come together and make a decision. But now that we've added staff to those teams, it's like, oh, 11 people are coming to this meeting to make a decision. Oh, we got to change that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we can't. We can't do that. We, we have to just stay focused. I, I, I so appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that as well. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I wanted to get in another question uh, that just rolled in. It's how do you as leaders fill your own cup? Would anyone like to? I will say, you know, I'm going to be an active listener on this one. Um, because this is an area of weakness for me. Um, I'm a joyful divorcee, no kids. It is so easy for me to grind it out morning, moon, noon, and mm -hmm. night. Um, and I take so much joy from what I do. 
But I also am cognizant that when I accelerate at a certain level, everybody else is going to say, hey, we've got to accelerate at that level. Even if I say, hey, there's no expectation. So what I've been trying to do is to really develop hobbies. Like I entered the world of fundraising as a major gifts officer. And at the time, the CEO who I reported to gave me some invaluable advice. And that was, nobody wants to develop a relationship with someone who's boring. You need to be a well-rounded person who can speak to your adventures over the weekend, who can talk about your favorite sports team, who can give a recommendation on a restaurant, right? If you're just like, In this little office, you have very little to add as you're forging relationships. And so I'm trying to do better with the adoption of hobbies. I love that. I, um, the only thing I would add to that is uh, yes to hobbies and like just stuff that brings you joy outside of work. Like there has to be something else right? Like I, and it, and it's hard because when you're in this field, like, and, and we're, we talked a lot about purpose. We talked a lot about being mission driven, right? Like when you get energy from what you do, it's hard to step away from that. And when you feel a sense of obligation, I mean, Kat, I'm thinking about like waking up at three o'clock in the morning, like thinking about all of the, the sort of like logistical things that have to happen because the impact is so great, right? Like the, the consequence of not meeting those expectations or not being able to serve in the same way is so great. Um, it's a lot of pressure, right? So like being able to um, balance that with, you know, Tysley, to your point with hobbies or with other things that that bring you joy. Um, for me specifically, it is unplugging. So it is like really intentionally sort of stepping away as difficult as that is um, and, and letting my mind um, sort of open up to other things because that helps me uh, come up with come up with the answer. Like it's in the quiet that I'm able to to solve some some problems that have been plaguing me for a little while. Oh my goodness, I um I, I just want to hear more from each and every one of you. <laughs> it's it's so extremely uh, great. I, I know time is running out, but I, I wanted to get in the last very question before we end our session. I want to know what is the biggest takeaway um, in a sentence or two, um, what's the biggest takeaway you want us to leave with today? Happy to go first. Um, I would say, I first, go. oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, no, first, go ahead. purpose is everything. And second, the this model is a movement and it's here to stay. And the quicker um, that your team can reckon with it and find pathways uh, for for it, the better. Yes. And I was just going to say, you know, just to keep in mind, the power um, is something that we can share. We have the power to share power. And I hope we're all just mindful of that. And I'll just add that your product is only as strong as the team implementing it. So invest in each other. Uh, So wonderful. Thank you all for joining us today with this wonderful discussion. I thank you all so very much and for the audience members as well. And uh, Michelle will follow up with you uh, in today's reporting and information about upcoming events. And we hope that you'll all join us for the third and final event in the Driving Change series on October 28th. That's coming up so quickly um, when a group of nonprofit leaders will discuss what driving change looks like uh, in the board meeting and board engagement, so sorry. Um, In the meantime, have a wonderful afternoon. And I thank you all again. I uh, can't wait to see you all again and continue our conversation.